So, who was the last common ancestor of Neanderthals and us modern humans? Or, you know, better known as Homo sapiens sapiens, because I always forget the second sapiens. Well, the last common ancestor of both the Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis is now seen as Homo heidelbergensis. What do we actually know about this enigmatic species of ancient humans? Well, my name is Kaylee, and in today's video, this is actually exactly what we're going to look at. And everything there is to know about Homo heidelbergensis and sort of the most up-to-date information that I could find, the way they looked and their culture and everything that we know so far, I will cover in this video. So, as per usual, if you've seen one or two of my videos about ancient species, you know I look at the location. So we're gonna go and take a look at where the very first bone of Homo heidelbergensis was found, because what some people don't know is that the species actually got its name from the location where the first bones were found. So in the country of Germany, we have the state of Baden-Württemberg, located in the southwest in the country. It's located in the southwest. Not much else to say about that. So the river Neckar runs through this state, and this is actually where the town of Heidelberg is located. So near the town of Heidelberg is a village known as Mauer, and it was between these two places that the very first bone of the Heidelberg man was discovered. So when <laughs> did this discovery happen? Well, the discovery of the very first bone of Homo heidelbergensis happened a little over a century ago, actually, back in 1907. A workman in a quarry discovered a mandible that was nearly complete, and approximately a year after the discovery, it was announced to the world by German anthropologist Otto Schutensack, that this mandible actually belonged to a new species in the Homo genus, now known as Homo heidelbergensis. So, one of the main reasons for the anthropologists to assign this mandible to an entirely new species is the morphology of the jaw, as it had small, modern human-like teeth, but the jaw itself was still quite extremely large and heavy boned, which is not like modern humans at all, but more like the archaic morphology of the earliest species in the Homo genus, like for instance Homo erectus that I covered in the past, Homo habilis that I covered in the past, and Homo antecessor, again, that I covered in the past. I've covered a lot of them so far, but we're still not done. And we have ghost species to cover, and going all the way back into the timeline, towards more like the great apes, we have a lot. But because at the time there was only one fossil of this new species, and you all can imagine that assigning this mandible to a new species was contested by many experts in the field of anthropology. And this only changed after the discovery of additional fossils in the end of the 20th century that had similar features and showed indeed that these fossils all belonged to this new species of Homo heidelbergensis. So, why does this species bear the name of Homo heidelbergensis? Well, as you all by now know, Homo is Latin for human. Don't come for me in my comments telling me I can't use the word Homo. People still do this, I don't know why. Homo is Latin for human, and Heidelbergensis is the sort of Latinized word for the location where the first fossil of this species was discovered. Heidelberg in the country of Germany. Or Deutschland. Both don't sound good. So the later discovered fossils of Homo Heidelbergensis have been found all over Africa and Europe, with even a very, very small chance that a f there were fossils possibly discovered in northern India that could belong to a Heidelbergensis species as well. Although this is contested and therefore I will not include that in this video beyond just mentioning it now, maybe creating a video on that in the future. It's possible. So I want to take a moment and talk about the most notable discovered fossils and the location where they were found, so you can get a bit of a picture in your mind of how spread out this species actually was. They did not live in just one location. So in 1921 at Broken Hill, which is now known as Kabwe in Zambia, 
a skull was discovered. And this skull belongs to a Homo heidelbergensis species. And it was actually the first fossil of a human ancestor that was discovered in Africa up until that point in time. And it actually opened up the entire debate for the out of Africa theory, which back then used to be the out of Asia theory. As at that point in time, all the oldest fossils of human ancestors had only been discovered in Asia. So this one fossil discovery changed the entire picture, which is why it's so important that we keep digging for more clues. So this skull showed some primitive features like a wide face, thick brow ridges that arch with a sloping forehead and quite the large brain capacity at 1280 cubic centimeters. It's quite large. A thing to note about the skull is that the researchers discovered that a number of abscesses had decayed on the upper jawbone and that this individual had quite the significant decay of its teeth. This last bit is actually really quite unusual in our ancient ancestors because tooth decay became much more prevalent after the development of agriculture approximately 10,000 years ago-ish as we started to eat more sugary and starchy food. So why were these teeth decaying like this? It's strange. So the skull is hard to date exactly because it's found in Africa and it's extremely hard to date things that come from Africa. But the guesstimate is that it's approximately 300,000 years old, which is actually about the same age as the oldest ever discovered Homo sapiens fossils that have been found at Jebel Irut in Morocco. So the next notable fossil that I would like to take a look at is known as Saldana. And this is a skull cap that has been discovered in Eilandsfontein in South Africa, which is located just southeast of Johannesburg, just outside of the cradle of humankind that I've only mentioned a couple dozen times at this channel right now. So this skull cap is similar to the one discovered at Broken Hill. And the similarities include the large brow ridge, the broad and sloping forehead, and a rear skull wall that is actually quite vertical instead of being rounded or sloping in shape. The next fossils, because we just continue on the list of the most notable ones, uh, were discovered in 1971 in France. To be exact, a skull and a lower jaw were found in the Arago Caves in Tutavel, France. And these are known as Arago 21, which is the skull, and Arago, which is the jaw. The Arago 21 skull is almost complete, although it has been distorted somewhat, most likely right before or during the fossilization process. And it was dated to belong to an individual that lived between 250,000 and 400,000 years ago, which again is really old. The features of the skull are actually similar to the other Homo heidelbergensis skulls that have been discovered. But there's one big difference, and that's that this skull is actually quite small. And the small size suggests that it either belonged to a female or a very young male. Next up, we have the fossilized remains of at least six individuals that have been discovered during excavations since 1976 at the archaeological site of Atapuerca in Spain. In the Grandolina cavern, archaeologists have discovered some 80 fragments of bone belonging to at least six individuals. Although, there is some controversy about the classification of these bones, as some anthropologists actually suggest that these bones belong to either Homo antecessor or even Homo erectus, as there are markings of cannibalism found on some of these bones. But the features are still really similar to the Homo heidelbergensis fossils that have been discovered. And if you've seen my Homo antecessor video, you know that they were known as sort of cannibals. So yeah, it's possible that they that these individuals were Homo antecessor and not Heidelbergensis. This actually does give weight to the theory that Homo Heidelbergensis is a direct descendant from Homo antecessor, who is again a direct descendant from Homo erectus. And this actually gives weight to the idea that Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals, 
are a direct descendant of Homo heidelbergensis, which is also modern humans' own ancestor. And Homo heidelbergensis might be the common ancestor of the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, and us modern humans. And the main reason that we were able to interbreed, as we still carry Denisovan and Neanderthal DNA within our genomes. And lastly, the fossil that I would like to mention is the box grove 1 specimen. This is a shin bone, but this shin bone is otherwise known as a tibia, and it was discovered during excavations in 1993 in Boxgrove, West Sussex, in England. And unfortunately, a carnivorous species has gnawed at both ends of this bone after death, but the remaining bit of bone does show us some signs that it belonged to a Homo heidelbergensis individual. On the back of the bone, run large ridges and these are the, actually the places where muscles used to be attached and this does indicate that this particular individual had quite large and powerful leg muscles. I would rather not be kicked by them because I think it will hurt like hell. So now that you know a little bit more about the spread of the species and the most notable finds and when they were discovered and how this, you know, how they looked like a little bit, I do think it's time to take a look into the morphology of this species and how it differs not only from us modern humans, but also how it differs from other ancient species living at the time. So the overall key features of Homo heidelbergensis are a mix between features found in Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, and us modern humans. It's a mix of a morphology, another mosaic. Because we haven't had a mosaic of a morphology in the past, now did we? The shape and size of the body is something that we really don't know too much about, as the fossil evidence is quite scarce. And we only know from like the leg bones that we found that we can conclude that they were at least quite tall, reaching a height of possibly even 180 centimeters. And the tibia's thickness actually suggests that they were very strongly built. This was not a lean species. They were, you know? So the lower legs actually seemed quite long, thick and strongly built, and the limb proportions suggest a great, very great adaptation to the tropical conditions as the larger skin surface actually helped to cool down the body. So the skull of Homo heidelbergensis was moderate, with a double arched brow ridge, short and sloping forehead, and a small narrowing behind the eye sockets. The brow ridge seemed to have been more arched than the earlier species, like Homo erectus, although the sloping forehead is more of an archaic feature, and it doesn't resemble the vertical forehead of us modern humans, or Homo sapiens. Sapiens? The nasal opening was actually quite wide, which is something I find peculiar. But I couldn't find any other information about this, so that's what I know. Now you know too. The brain of Homo heidelbergensis was large. It averaged approximately 1250 cubic centimeters, which represented approximately 1.9% of their total body weight, which really is quite large. It also seemed that the frontal and parietal lobes in the brain were enlarged, and this is an indication of an increase in their brain complexity. More evidence on that complexity later in the video. So the jaws of Homo heidelbergensis seemed shorter than the older species in the Homo genus, which makes the face of Homo heidelbergensis less projecting. So the lower jaw, was still strongly built for the attachment of the strong chewing muscles and the lower jaw did not have a protruding chin as we see in the later species. The chin had more characteristics of the older species like Homo erectus and Homo antecessor. So the teeth were really smaller than the earlier species in the Homo genus. Although they were still quite large and still quite larger than the teeth of us modern humans. So the teeth were arranged in the jaw to form a parabolic shape, and they were curved at the front and splayed out in the back. Some individuals of Homo heidelbergensis have a gap called a retromolar space between the third 
molar and wisdom teeth at the back of the jaw, while other individuals either did not show this gap or just a tiny one. So it's unsure if that was a mutation, uh, if that was just an individual having that. We, we, we don't know. Je ne sais pas. So it seemed that the origins of Homo heidelbergensis lie around at least 800,000 years ago, although they seem to have stayed quite a while in Africa. By approximately 500,000 years ago, they were already spread out everywhere into Europe and possibly even Asia. So around 300,000 years ago, the regional differences started to slowly develop as the species adapted to their new environments which always influences the evolution of a species. So as I mentioned just now, it seemed like approximately 800,000 years ago, Homo heidelbergensis emerged for the first time. The climate in Africa and Europe seemed to change somewhere between 600,000 and 200,000 years ago with warm and cool phases. And therefore, during the warmer phases, it seems like Homo heidelbergensis started to follow the colder temperatures into Europe. And it seems like the species started to adapt over time to this colder climate. So Homo heidelbergensis populations seem to have traveled through Europe and Africa during this time, although around some approximately 300,000 years ago, the Sahara became a very dry barrier during a severe cold spell, which seemed to have limited the movement between the populations between Africa and Europe. It seems like they got stuck in place, so to say. It's around this time where we can actually recognize the noticeable regional differences between the Homo heidelbergensis populations in Europe and the Homo heidelbergensis populations in Africa. So now that we know what they looked like and when they first emerged, I think it's time to take a look at what we know about their culture and their lifestyle, their environment and sort of their diet. Because I'm just as curious as you. So, you know, let's um, dive right in, shall we? Uh, I mentioned in my recent video about the discovery of tools near Canterbury in England that belonged to Homo heidelbergensis that their tools were mostly created and used for hunting and butchery and their tools were really similar to the ones created by Homo erectus. These tools are known as the Old One Stone Tool Industry or Mode One Technology. Although Homo heidelbergensis seemed to have perfected the technology as they were mostly creating Acheulean stone tools, which is known as Mode 2 technology. Back in April, I actually created a video about how the oldest stone tools ever discovered predate all ancient human species. And I highly recommend the watch. And you can see the thumbnail right here. And you can learn that the oldest stone tools that we have discovered so far are more than 3 million years old. That's a mind um, <clears throat> fudge. The tools they created were mostly by facial stone, hand axes, cleavers and carvers. Uh, typical stone tools of the Acheulean industry, you know, which is again otherwise known as mode 2 technology. Later populations of Homo heidelbergensis created tools from deer antlers and bone and wood. And these were modified into scrapers, hammers, wooden throwing spears that were actually quite sophisticated for their time. It seems like Homo heidelbergensis were creating and using fire, although some experts like to contest this, which I personally find very strange. Why would you contest the idea of Homo heidelbergensis creating and controlling fire? Because we know that the creation and control of fire has been around for a very, very long time long before Homo heidelbergensis even emerged. So why would they be unable to do this? It's a very strange idea in my head. It is believed that Homo heidelbergensis wore clothes, especially in the areas in Europe that have a colder climate. But as you can imagine, clothing really degrades a lot faster over time. So we don't have any clear and tangible evidence of them having clothes or making clothes. 
But I personally believe that it is actually safe to say that, that they at least created something from animal hides to keep themselves warm, especially since we have found tools like scrapers that would have been used to scrape these hides to prepare them for the creation of shelters and clothing items. So it would be weird to think that they would be running around naked in a cold climate. Doesn't make any sense. We also know that Homo heidelbergensis hunted large animals for food. And when I say large animals, think of animals like rhinos, hippos, bears, horses and deer. These animals seem to have been hunted with quite a level of skill and then butchered in quite an organized fashion, which suggests that Homo heidelbergensis worked together in groups. But what more can we uncover about their culture? Is this all that we know or is there more? Well, we all know that near the end of the Paleolithic, the human populations were creating art by engraving stones and bones and painting in caves with ochre. Lots of evidence for this. Although there's not much evidence of this in the middle and the early Paleolithic. So did they? Could they? That's the question. Well, in fact, only 27 objects dating from the early and middle Paleolithic era are known to have been engraved with symbolic etchings that we know are not just happenings over time. Three pebbles dating back to 380,000 years ago were discovered at Terra Amata in France. A bone dating back to 370,000 years ago was discovered to have been engraved in Bilzingsleben in Germany. A 250-year-old pebble from Markliberg in Germany. 18 pebbles dating back to approximately 200,000 years ago were discovered near Lazareth in France. A lithic dating back to approximately 200,000 years ago that was discovered in La Grotta de Observator in Monaco. And a pebble dating back to between 200,000 and 130,000 years ago that was discovered near the Bambon in France. That was a mouthful and I made a couple mistakes, but let's pretend I didn't, because you won't see them anyway. Homo heidelbergensis seem to have evolved into quite the adept spear makers, actually. The Clacton spearhead that you can see here, dating back to approximately 400,000 years ago, was most likely created by a Homo heidelbergensis individual. And if you've seen my Doggerland video, again, thumbnail, Highly recommend the watch if you haven't seen it, because, I mean, it's a mini documentary and I really worked hard on it. But you most likely have seen the Schöningen spears that I mentioned in that video. And these spears were most likely created by a Homo heidelbergensis population and they date back to 300,000 years ago. They actually show the sophistication of Homo heidelbergensis and how their tool creation evolved over time. Homo heidelbergensis was a species that emerged, spread out over a vast area, developed and evolved by adapting to their local climate, the flora and the fauna, and they seem to have been great at surviving and even thriving in areas that they populated. And somewhere in their evolution, a branch split off from them that eventually led to the Neanderthals and another branch split off from them that eventually led to us, Homo sapiens, modern humans. Homo heidelbergensis played a significant role in the human evolutionary timeline for not just us, Homo sapiens, but other species as well. The Neanderthals seem to have eventually taken over their habitat before later on we took over the habitat over time from the Neanderthals. But with that said, if you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like these, and click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, I highly recommend clicking the card in the upper right corner, or click a video in the description down below, or click a video in the end card. I mean, it's always set to best for viewers, so YouTube caters to you. And I would like to say a massive thank you to my channel members and my patrons. And if you enjoy my work, consider becoming a channel member or a patron. And with that said, this was Homo heidelbergensis and what we know so far. And I'll see you in the next one.
拜拜。